You think Jesus has supernatural power, so therefore he didn't have to give him to wealth? No. Then he's cheated because you don't have that supernatural power. He came as a weak man, just like you. It was the foolishness of God. Paul writes, the foolishness of God is across. The weakness of God. Do you understand? God became foolish in Jesus because he became a man. What a risk. Because he could be tempted and he could fall and he could make mistakes. He's the one who saved me. We're going to worship God with your finances and our money. I'm going to take it from Deuteronomy this time. We've not finished with Malachi. I'm going to go back there. But Deuteronomy tells us a story. And the people had left bondage. They left Egypt. They left their chains, their shackles, their sicknesses, their diseases. They have left to the promised land. Many of us are like that today. Many of you in Colombo who come to this church are like that. You've left the pain, the suffering. you left your brokenness. And you come to Jesus and things are getting better. Your marriages are being healed. Your finances are being healed or was healed, okay? And uh, things are looking good. And then God warns the people who are walking towards the promised land. And he, wa he warns them like this. And he says this in Deuteronomy 8. You can have it up there. In verse 8 or verse 7. For the Lord, your God, is bringing you into a good land. This is your promise. A land of brooks, of water, of fountains, of springs that flow with the valleys and hills. The land of wheat and barley and wines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olives and oil and honey. So here's the promise. You're walking towards the land of milk and honey. Many of you have experienced that. You come to WOW on the first couple of days, the first one month, two months, three months. And you realize, man, things are looking so good. My life is so good. My finances have changed. Trust me. You come to this church, your finances will change. Trust me. But it won't last. It'll change. It'll be transformed. People come, they get healed. First day, second day, they start getting healed and they stay at home. They stay at home. You're coming into a good land. You're walking in. Your finances are getting better. Yes, I agree. But what were the values that changed in your heart? When your heart changed, your finances changed. When your heart changed, your body changed. When your heart changed, your, man man your marriage changed. The people around you change, your friends change, your loyalties changed, your commitments changed. It came from your heart. God speaks to the heart again. In verse 11, it says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God, nor keep his commandments, hmm? his judgments, and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full, this is what happens when you're eaten and full. That's why we fast sometimes in this church. Sometimes you must fast, not just the food. You fast what you like. That's what you fast. Hmm? So it says, So when you have eaten and you are full, you have built beautiful houses now, and you dwell in them. And when you, your herds and your flock have multiplied, and your silver and your gold have multiplied, and all that you have have multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness. This is my friend, everyone's story. They give the testimony and the last time I see them was on the day that they gave the testimony. That's the truth. That's the truth. I've seen it. It happens. 
to the best of men. And this is what the Lord says in verse 18. You go down, you must read this. It's a, it's a wonderful verse. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He. I want you to say this here. I want you to say this with me. And I pray that you'll remember Him with your money today, with your success today. I pray that you remember Him. He says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. Lest you forget that what you saw here, what you enjoyed all your life, you didn't have it before you came. You touched his heart. He touched yours. Things shifted and changed. He gave you the power to have wealth, to be healed, to have commitment, to have friends, to have loyalty like never before, to have strength like never before. It is he who gives you the power. I want you to take your finances in your hand and make it worthy of what he has done. And say, Lord, this is not worth this is what you, how you speak to your money. Say this to your money. Say this. It's so important. Take it in your hand. Say, this is not worthy of your son, oh God. It is not worthy of your son. Lest I think. Lest I think. Lest I think. Come on, say it. I can't hear you. This is not worthy of your son. My Lord. Lest I think that I have the power to make my life different. Come on. Come and so. Come and so. Lord, this offering not worthy of your son, Jesus Christ. This is us telling you that we want to be partakers in your cost, partakers in your suffering. Taking the spirit of money and mammon that the world worships and putting it in this offering means that we do not worship the consumer system. We don't worship mammon. We don't worship the world and what it has to offer. We worship you. You come first in our life. And Lord, we know that if we seek you first, all those things that are in the consuming world will be ours because we worship you more than anything else, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's see. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's Wow Sunday. It's Communion Sunday. <laughs> That was an awesome, absolutely beautiful worship session, didn't you think? Do you want to show some appreciation? If you all didn't clap loud enough, I would have said go and sow a seed into those, the, the bandies. You can do both. <laughs> you can do both. Um, okay, this is just a reminder that um, we are having our meet and greet. So if you're new to WOW, 
straight after the communion service, we're going to meet over in the green room, and you're, we'll introduce ourselves. You can introduce yourself, meet the leadership, and we can get to know each other. Okay, so if you're new today and you didn't know about it, you can probably speak to Salia, CEO, over there, and he will escort you in. Okay? Um, also, just a reminder for all our friends, well, actually anywhere in the world, um, we are having um, a cruise, which um, I, I know a lot of us in these parts might not have gone on cruises before, and when I heard about the cruise, my first cruise, I was like, I don't want to be stuck on a boat somewhere. And then Linda was like, it's not a boat, it's a cruise. I was like, okay, fine. And um, I was pleasantly surprised. We had an absolutely beautiful time, and you actually get to visit different parts of the world. We actually visited uh, different parts of Mexico. But this time, it's going to be the Caribbean, OK? And it's going to be in 2026. Um, but you uh, would probably need to book places now as there's very limited uh, rooms kept off, cabins kept off for wildlife. Uh, plus, I think it's make an awesome Christmas present for someone. So if you want to give them a cruise, it's happening in 2026. <laughs> Um, also, uh, we will be visiting the USA for the five-day program, okay? Five-day program is really cool for all of you who know. It. We've been doing it for many, many years. Um, and there's no better time to do it than the beginning, around the beginning of the year. So that will be in Missouri um, at the Cedar Creek. Yeah, because it's a fasting program. Kirby wants me to explain because some of your faces look like they've forgotten what a fast is. <laughs> well, after the whole Christmas festivities, trust me, I think we'll all want to go on a fast, right? But this is really cool because it's fasting mixed with feeding yourself with the awesome riches of God, God's word. And it's just absolutely one of the most amazing experiences. Trust me, it has to be if I'm promoting it because I was anti-fasting, okay? So, yeah, you all know that. Um, okay, so those, yeah, that's happening. Um, right, so now, okay, meet and greet. Yeah, that's about all. Um, okay, so now to give you a, a, a little brief today um, about what we've been doing with positive theology is... Actually, when we called it positive theology, I just looked a little deeper into positive theology, negative theology, right? And positive theology is a theology that says God is. God is love, you know? God is um, uh, your savior, like your father. It, it's affirmative, and it, it's in terms that you can relate to God with, okay? And it promotes, like, devotion and worship and things like that. But there's also something called negative theology, and it's not what you think, right? Negative theology, I think it's apophatic and cataphatic, right? Negative theology is more to do with the mysteries of God. Like God is not. God is not like you humans, you know? God is not like this. God's, uh, you know, his ways are so much higher than your ways. So it's, it's telling you what he's not. And then you relate to him through the negative. And I think both are important. Okay, and I think, I believe that I have been laying the base of both of it for you, even though it's po called positive theology. And also, Kirby's more the mystical, right? I'm more the practical, so positive, negative. <laughs> okay, so today I want to share something with you, um, which I think is really important for us as we enter into the community of Christ, okay? Now, we have a very vast audience, a very mixed audience all across the world, but especially here in Sri Lanka, we have people from all different faiths, right? Um, and all different denominations who've just suddenly come into the family of God here, the community of God here at Wow Life Church. And when you're doing that, there's so many presumptions, presuppos presuppositions we walk in through the door with, okay? And even if not, we walk in through this, these doors having mingled with the world. I mean, having our feet so grounded in the world, the worldly systems, the worldly values. And so this is really important because um, it, it, I, I learned about it this term at, at Fuller Seminary when we're learning about Luther's theology of the cross, Okay, and I thought it was absolutely marvelous because it explains what we're trying to explain, but it gives a name to it, and that's the Latin word subcontrario. Okay, subcontrario means 
hidden under the opposite or, you know, it's not what you expect. It's just the opposite. And so I thought this is brilliant because the ways of God, and he, he brought it in in context to the theology of the cross. Right, And he contrasted it to what was in that time in medieval Roman um, Catholicism. It was a theology of glory. And he meant that in a negative sense. And I don't mean negative like mysticism. I mean negative, like it, it wasn't, it was bad. It was something that glorified um, riches and wealth and power. God was a distant being um, that you didn't have contact with and all you had as your earthly reference was this very powerful structure, you know, where everything was so glorified and it looked almost, it, it looked exactly worldly. And so people didn't know to read at the time. There was no Bible that they could access. So people were really lost on how to connect with God. There was no relationship like you have today. And then, then on the contrary, you have on the subcontrario, you had this naked God, this naked man, shame, actually shameful, like nothing much to look at, hanging on this cross. And this is supposed to be our salvation. This is supposed to be our victory. And, and so it was like, it, it, it disoriented people. It's like, it, it was hard to believe. It required faith. It required faith. It required a pressing in. It required a searching. And so to give you a little more examples on subcontrario, if we look at Genesis, right, in Genesis 3, you look at it and Adam and Eve are there in the garden. They're looking at this tree. And when they're looking at it, it's like it's so pleasing to the eye. And I want you to imagine that when you go out into the world, everything that you see sometimes is so beautiful. And I'm not saying it's wicked, okay? I'm just trying to realign your value system. I'm trying to realign um, what you aspire to, what you what you intend for, what is important to you, what defines you, what encourages you, what discourages you. you know? And so this, this is the perfect example because Adam and Eve were there and this looks so good. It was so tempting. It was like they just wanted to reach out and touch it because it was supposed to make them wise, right? It's like the intellect that you can gain, the technology that you can gain. And it was really, really beyond uh, their self-control. They reached out and they took it. Okay, now on, on the flip side of that, let's look at Isaiah 53. And this is a picture of what we're looking at when we see the cross, right? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, he is rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. And this is the figure of shame, the figure of, you know, it's just like, it's just, honestly, it's like nothing much. And it just contradicts everything you hold and value and aspire to in your lives today. But in this, the message of the cross, in this is the power of God. In this, it's, the, it's foolishness for those who are perishing. It's like they can't get their head around it. Imagine the Roman Empire, like with so much majesty conquering the height of the Roman Empire, conquering half the world, you know, and they were like, we are, you know, we are gods ourselves. The Caesars are gods. Imagine the Greek gods, you know, it was all about power and dominion. And they were, humanity was emulating that. And this, a suffering God. And sometimes I think we fear, we fear weakness. We really fear weakness because of what we're trained to in the world. And I'm not asking you to be a church of weak people in a sense of oh, give in to anything, be pushovers. That's not the weakness we're talking about. We're talking about identifying in each other's suffering identifying in the suffering of Christ. And people are scared of that because it looks hopeless. It looks hopeless and it draws you in and you're like, oh, no, 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 what's the point of suffering? 
What's the point? We all have suffered. We all have lost. We all have felt moments of no hope. And how do I gain hope looking at this, knowing that Christ suffered with me, as me, for me? How does it help me? How does it help you? And then you push through beyond that. And you push through beyond it because you understand that this was the biggest plan that God had for us. It, 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 it confounded the wise. It just confounded the minds of those who thought they knew better. And in it was the plan and the power for you and me. And if we identify in this suffering, if we look at that and know God is with us, He's truly with us. He was with you in your deepest, darkest moment, in the dark night of your soul. He's there for you today. He'll, he was there for you yesterday. He'll be there for you always, but not as a distant God. Christ on the cross proves that God is not a distant, almighty, powerful, impossible, you know, God. He's also a God who relates with you. He's also a God who resides in you and who lives with you. And if we can understand that, then we can push through into the power of the resurrection. Philippians talks about that. He says, identify in his suffering so that we can now identify in the resurrection. Sufferings are easy, right? Because we all suffer. It's a human, human nature to suffer. But resurrection, it's power. It shows something beyond human limitation. It shows something beyond death. Are you telling me that death can't separate us? Are you telling me that we can conquer death? Are you telling me that this is possible? How, what does it look like in our day-to-day -day lives to be able to walk in that resurrection power? And so subcontrario is beautiful because it reminds us, it reminds us to shift gears. It disorients us a little bit. And then it helps us to really re-evaluate what we look up to. What are we allowing into our lives? What do we allow into our culture? What do we allow into our community that is taking away our peace, taking away the love we have, how we relate to each other? Do you know that if we were driven by mammon and the way of the world, we would treat each other very badly? We might treat you nicely to your face, but inside we're like plotting. <laughs> you, you, because it's like, you know, you need to push through. Somebody's got to make it. It's like there's only a limited pieces in the pie. We have to, be, we have to grab. It's eat or be eaten. Right? It's a, it's a performance-driven world out there. And here, we're telling you, <laughs> we're actually telling you, you know, make your material wealth and everything bow down. What does that look like? What does it look like? And we're saying, then you'll be rich. Then you'll be rich. And then you'll honor the, the one who gives you the power. Who? The suffering God on the cross gives me the power? That gives me the power? That is the symbol of my power? Poverty? Death? Sickness? All that just hanging there? <laughs> yes. Because through that is your victory. Okay, and in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. This is the paradox. This is the paradox we live in, and this is the community that we want to emulate here. And these are the people and the, the lives that we know you can, you, if you can tap into this, wow. If we can tap into this, and if we can draw power without fear, a lot of people run away from suffering. But if we can really draw on it and understand that God is amongst his people, he's with his people, not for the sake of suffering as an end, but for the sake of resurrection as an end. Okay, then we will have victory in all things. So that is your dose of positive theology for the day. And are you ready for your dose of negative theology? <laughs> okay, wow, get ready, give it up for... Okay. Your love got me feeling so high, got me feeling so high, got me feeling like I can change the world tonight. Come on, Wow Sunday, this is your communion Sunday service. We're going to have an awesome, awesome message. Take a seat. Our focus today is the table of the Lord. So, um, yes, we shall see healings, we shall see miracles, but the focus is the table. If you focus on the sacrifice, you will get everything the sacrifice has to offer. Uh, a lot of the times, so when, 
when Fiona says uh, negative theology, uh, she's saying it in the best, uh, best theological way, and that's exactly right. She's got a, po a positive theology, I've got a negative theology, and a negative theology uh, doesn't sometimes, uh, it doesn't grandiose your salvation. Yeah, and so uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I'm, I, I, would, I would explain to you um, what the whole, what you don't see, the things that are hidden. And today I want you to see that when she, when she talks of, I don't know even how to pronounce it, but subcontrario, I hope I did, that, did justice, yeah. subcontrario, it means literally, just understand that it is the opposite of what you think. You see, the suffering God can save you. Okay, the person on the cross, just understand, the person on the cross, I, I want you to see it, is you. Okay, so because Christ in you. So uh, uh, Paul says, it like, he said, I am crucified in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So now Jesus crucified, was crucified 2,000 years ago, but when you come to the table, you need to see that I too, my ego, the word ego comes from the New Testament, the word ego, I am now crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yea, now me, but Christ now lives inside of me. So now you are dying. So when you come to the table, it is your death. You see, if you don't understand it, and so what is revealed when the, when the cloth comes out of the uh, Corpus Christi, the dead person who is lying here, and you see the body of Christ, and when you eat of the table, you are taking your portion of who is dead. If you don't see that, you can never have, you can become be a partake of the table. So you need to first identify, and I want to read it from 1 Corinthians 11, because we are going in, remember, we are in, uh, we are in 1 Corinthians 13 and 12 of the aspects and the gifts of Christ, and so the series continues, and we are in healing. And I want you to be healed today. Yeah. I want you to have a, a, a restored uh, physiology, a mind, a restored mindset, a restored, a restored marriage. I want healing to come into every area of your life. Yeah. But for that healing to come, you first need to self-reflect. Uh -huh. yeah. That's the key. Yeah. So when you look at not the glorious one on the cross, the one who saves you is not the resurrected Christ. Think about it for, for a moment of time. You know, a lot of the charismatic Pentecostals sometimes talk about the resurrected Christ and they have an empty cross in their, uh, in their church. You see, and Cobus Van Rensburg used to always wear not an empty cross, but a proper cross. Because the one who save you is not the one who's resurrected. The one who saves you is the one, the Corpus Christi, the one who is crucified. The, the suffering, dying Jesus is the one who saves you. You have to get this. So when you come to the table, if you don't see your suffering, your iniquity, your mistakes, not accusation. A lot of people don't, um, they misunderstand, uh, even the way we minister to people. When we discuss, they come to us and we are, very, we are grace preachers. We believe that righteousness comes by faith. We believe that God has forgiven you. We believe the cross has, been, has settled the score, that it is finished with God and you. We believe that, truly. But when, we, when you come and talk to us, we will point out certain aspects, certain mistakes, certain, um, uh, certain places where you are weak. And so we don't compromise. We don't say, oh, there's grace and you're forgiven, so I can't point this out. No, I say, point it out. This here, right is wrong. But I will not accuse you. There's a difference between judgment, and this is something you must learn, and there's a difference between accusation. Judging a matter is so important. So when you come in to this, I hope you judge the matter. Have you judged, weighed, judge means evaluated correctly. Have you been fair in judging the matter of your life? You see, and it is only that in weakness will your strength be made perfect. Wow. The Bible says that his strength is made perfect when you are strong. No, it's when you're dead, when you're suffering, when you're broken, and when you can identify with your weakness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's when his strength is made perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That means you can get only half of his strength if you receive only half, if you receive the fullness. Hmm? If, you, if you go through the papers and you look at all the politicians who, who've taken bribes and all this, and it's like, these guys must go to prison. Okay, and you call out for blood and your, your nature is bloodthirsty and you want justice to be done. And the next time you do a contract, and maybe you have to sort of slightly do something a bit off, hmm? that might not look like the bribe that they have taken but it's likely you're bending the rules. But because you're a good Christian, you don't say that it's corruption, you call that favor. <laughs> you say, I'm so blessed, I have so much favor, I have so much. Or you say, I'm so connected. 
I just know them. Oh, but so they bend the rules, so it's the same thing? Okay? And so you're not ready to receive. You don't judge, rightly judge the matter. But you can point out at someone else and say he's corrupt. So you don't receive the fullness of the grace and the mercy that is available to you. So then this table can only do half, 75%. When you come to this table and say, I'm a thief just like them. There's no difference between that man and me. There's no accusation on that. There's no accusation. You're not accusing yourself, but you're bringing yourself into a place where you judge yourself properly, correctly. Don't accuse yourself. Accusation is over on the cross. Jesus Christ came into the world. I mean, he came into the world. Let's read this verse. In, um, in, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 20. Verse 23. Hmm? Verse 27, sorry. Verse 27. And says it like this. Therefore, whoever eats his bread and drinks his cup in the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Unworthy manner. That doesn't mean the unworthiness doesn't mean you're a sinner. Jesus has forgiven your sins. There's an unworthiness that you can eat this table. So you've got to eat it in a worthy manner. But let a man, this is how you eat it with a worthy manner. But let a man examine himself. Okay? So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So if you first examine yourself. So many people, if you're going to the traditional communion table, if they are in adultery, if they are, um, uh, if they are doing something wrong, if they have maybe killed someone that week, okay, or stolen, they will not eat the table because they are sinners. Hmm? They've done something wrong, so they are out of the church. And so the church will say, no sinners here. In fact, I went to, recently I went to an Anglican church. My father is Anglican. I was taken to the Anglican church uh, all my life in the mornings uh, and on Christmas Day and then to the Methodist church. My mother is a Methodist uh, uh, reverend's uh, daughter. So I grew up. In fact, the Anglican church, you can type it, type it online, has, has a service called a communion combination service. Have you seen that? A combination service where they would curse every sinner. Yeah. Go to it. It's, it's online. It's, I'm just, it's public. There's nothing wrong in that because that's that, the way their body works. If you're in adultery, you're cursed. If, you're in, um, if, you are, um, if you are an alcoholic, you're cursed. Yeah. Okay, and I, I remember this is what you call a combination service. Okay, and because sinners can't eat of that table. Not in this service. I'm talking of different denominations. In the Orthodox service, Catholics can't eat of that table. Because they were the first. And therefore, when the, when the Catholics broke away, they're like, no, we can't have anyone who is out of our communion to eat of that table. When the Catholics had the Anglicans break away, the Anglicans can't eat off the table because of anathema. They are not a part of that body. And so they are cursed. There are times you see in the Catholic service and the Orthodox service where they will curse every Protestant. You can't eat off the table. We're talking about churches cursing ch uh, churches here, right? Okay. Forget about people. Okay. A mother, a father can be upset with their children. Maybe with you. How is your relationship with your mom and dad? Do you know that the Bible calls for the blessing if you are good with your parents? Do you know that if your parents bless you, that there is a blessing? This is in New Testament. There's a real blessing upon your life if your parents bless you. Very important. But today, your mother and father might not bless you. Hmm? Maybe your own brother and your sister get up every day cursing you. Why is this table important? This table is a very important table. On the night the Lord was betrayed, it says. Betrayal means when someone looks at you, he's known you, he's seen you, he's probably understood you very well before. But suddenly, has that, has that ever happened to you? Innocently, you're accused. You have no idea why? Suddenly they got offended. Maybe it was a Facebook post. Maybe you didn't make their mother's funeral. Maybe it was a birthday wish that you didn't do. But suddenly, there's a bitterness and offense that is built. Has this happened to you? You're ostracized from your people. Friends are cut off. Offense builds around you. You're wondering what is going on. The curse and accusation against you is brewing. 
This table is open. This table has been open for that. Watch what is happening. If you think that God is angry with you, my dear friends, I must tell you that God, 2,000 years ago, sent his only begotten son into the world to forgive sinners from all their sins. No matter what your sin is, the cross and the blood of Jesus is big enough to forgive you. He looked down from heaven and he said, here's my son. I'm coming as my son. I'll die as you. And every sin now is broken so that God will not accuse you. God doesn't accuse anymore. But who does accuse you? That person whose birthday you didn't wish. That mother and father who thinks that now you've grown too strong and too big and maybe they should put you right. Your brother and your sister who doesn't believe in you. On the night that you were betrayed, the one who worked with you, the one you discipled, the one you brought up, that person has turned against you. The one who was in your company that you looked after, looked after his mother and his father and paid for his bills, that person now has let you down. The one you helped and you worked for, that person now has thrown you out on a night that you were betrayed. Do you think just because God has now forgiven you that man's intention and their thoughts towards you, if, especially if it's a mom and a father and a brother and a sister and someone close, do you think that those has no power over you? Let's not be so foolish. If Then Jesus does not need to come down as a man. Yeah. Jesus could have come down as an angel. Jesus, God could have shouted forgiveness from the heavens yeah. if man does not have that power. Yeah. If man's intentions, his will, his thoughts does not have power. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Then Jesus does not have to come as a man because he made man in the image in the likeness of God to create through words of their mouth through the thoughts that they have in their head he made man powerful creators man in his fallen nature get bitter and angry man in his fallen nature can speak blessing with his tongue and speak curses with his tongue therefore God so loved the world that he sent a man. Because it is only through a man that you can receive blessing and forgiveness. <laughs> a dolphin can't bless you, my dear friends. A horse can make you calm, but it can't bless you. A vegetable offered in, a, in some place can't bless you, my friend. The blood of a bull and a goat cannot save you from your sickness and your disease, my friend. When a man curses and a man speaks against you and a mother and father comes against you and a community comes against you and when people of God from one church curses another church, you have no chance. You have no chance. And that is why the table is open. Because man has the power to save you. And that's why Jesus came as a man. And if you don't get that, if you don't understand it, you could have come as anything else. He could have come as an extraterrestrial. Hmm? Yeah. He could have come as, that's why I don't believe the extraterrestrial theory like that, because there's a theological error. Yeah. Was Jesus an alien, come from a planet? No, he can't be. He has to be a man. He has to be just like you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To save you. Yes. You see? And so he, can't, he can't, couldn't have been an alien. Could, have been, could he have been a deity, maybe a mix between a god and a man? No. He can't be a mix between god and a man. He has to be just like you. Tempted just like you. Hmm? Yeah. Otherwise, he's cheating. It's a cheat. Yeah. Hmm? Jesus was just like you. Tempted just like you. You understand that? And because he was just like you, he has the power to save you. Because if you think something extra outside of just you can save you, then what's going to happen is then it's a cop-out. Yeah. Yeah. When things go wrong, you can never save or use the things that Jesus has given you. You can never believe that forgiveness from you can heal your husband or your wife. Come on. Today people are sick because their husbands are offended. Today people are sick because their wives are offended. Yes. Today people are sick because their brothers and sisters are offended and hurt. When my, when my parents uh, got sick, the first thing I did was seek, seek deep inside of me and say, Oh God, 
Give me a heart to forgive every area and aspect of my father and mother's life. Every area that I've been angered, offended, upset. I don't want my parents sick, Lord. You know, parents let children down, please. If you're a young, young parent, trust me, give it another 20 years, you'll see how much you let them down. Trust me, trust me, trust me. You can't, no one's perfect. Yeah. Do you understand that? No one's perfect. Brothers and sisters betray each other. Community betray each other. That's what it is. That's why this table is offered. I'll show you. Please listen. Mark 12. Today the, break, the curses break. If you see it, the curses break. If you eat this table in the right way, the curses break. That's why we teach what we teach. Listen carefully. So he says, therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner drinks guilt of the body. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks what? Eats and drinks what? Judgment of himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Right? For this reason, many are weak. Is it there? What is the reason? Can I have it up there? For this reason, many are weak, many are sick. What happened? Verse 20, verse 30. For this reason, many are weak. For this reason, many are weak. For this, what reason? So why are you sick? Someone asked the question. Why is someone sick? Why do I get sick? Do you think I get sick? Of course I get sick. Why do I get sick? Why do holy men get sick? Prophet Kobus got cancer. He was 63 years old when he passed. My spiritual dad, Pastor Neil, died. He was 63. No, 60. Yeah, a little older. Hmm? That's, not a, that's not the age that you die at. Come on. We don't, you know, in all this, Neil preached grace. Come on, Israel, you know Neil preached grace. Hmm? Prophet Kobus was a man that I look at and I used to think this man is so close to Jesus. He's so close. He said, he's a walking, talking word. 63, he died. For this reason. <laughs> For what? Come on, I can't hear you. For this reason, many are weak. They're sick. And many have now passed away. For what reason? I'm going to tell you again. This is the power of this table. For this reason. Do you understand? So we stick to the word. Now listen carefully. If you change this around. For if we would judge ourselves, wow. Okay, what did you, if you're going to call it, what contrario? Subcontrario. If we would judge ourselves, then we would not be judged. That we not be, not be condemned with the world. This is a beautiful scripture that saves your life. It doesn't accuse yourself. Evaluate, my friend. Judge. See it from that point of view. I remember a time when I was... I, I, told, I told you a story. I was bitten by a caterpillar. I got sick. Uh, they said that I got Parkinson's or whatever it is. Uh, my hands were shaking for about a year. I was looking. I was praying to God. I said, Lord, what do I need to do? How do I need to get healed? And I started self-reflecting, self-reflecting, sitting there every day thinking, God, how do I get healed? I need your healing. I need to, I'm, the, I'm the preacher. I'm preaching on healing, but I'm still I'm sick. I remember at that time, the Lord revealed certain things to me. Certain aspects that I self reflect If you judge yourself, you will not be judged. Watch this. Very simple. There is judgment out there. How many of you know that there is judgment out there on your life? Come on. Anyone here without judgment? Anyone without here that people have not judged you? Anyone here who can say, no, no one judges me? Anyone here who feels not judged? Yeah. I mean, I've preached grace for 15 years. Sundays, you know grace like, as much as I would know grace, right? Okay. We've, I mean, we've gone on a journey together. Are there times that you feel completely not judged by people? There are times you feel 100% that you're not judged by God. I know that for sure because you know grace well. I hardly, I mean, there is, I've never had a place in my life after understanding grace that I feel that judged by God. I've never felt judged by God. Never do I feel accused or judged by God. But do I feel judged by people? No, for sure. Come on. You think that has no impact? Hmm? I'd rather be judged by God. I know I'll be judged fairly. But do I get judged by people? For sure. Hmm. Very interesting. But if you judge yourself, when you eat this table, hmm, you shall not be judged and condemned with the world. Hmm? Yes, yes, come on, someone clap. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. You judge yourself. 
I remember I, uh, I was, when, I, when we first started, you know, you start mystery school, I tell people to write on both sides, you know, we call it the good and the bad. And you write on both sides the good and the bad, and so the good, so as you come to God, I say, write to Bible, says, write who you are, the good. What do you think of yourself as a good person? So everyone's writing, like, da, 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 yes, I'm so good at this, I'm so good at that, and all this, and oh my God, wow, I've church, grace, teachings, people, God loves me, I'm a son, I feel, you know, all the good stuff. And I say, now, now write on the other side, exactly, it's a black and white mirror, so write on the other side what you feel that you are, like, who you are, like the terrible person. I want, don't show it to anyone else, but write it, okay? And so, one or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I get a bit angry, and... I said, no, you've got to write everything there. Yeah. Write everything there, okay? And you'll realize that, you see, with, with Fiona and me, very few people, not very few, actually no, no one, even our spiritual father, could never tell us, this area in your life needs improvement. No. Because we know it. We know the areas in our life that need improvement. This area in life you've got to work at. No. There's no justification. We have judged ourselves. Right. Judge yourself. Right. Yeah. And then you will not be judged right. or condemned. Well. For this reason, come on. For this reason, many are sick. Many are sick because they don't have the ability to turn around and judge themselves. The reason for that is because the, the church has preached that God is judging you and accuses you. God does not judge you. He forgave you. He sent his only begotten son as a man, died as a man. So now he is completely done. There is no judgment. It is humanity's judgment that he came for. Humanity accused. Humanity said things about you. And because of that, he said, okay, because you think Shane is like this, Amy, <laughs> because Shane has these weaknesses, and because Shane has made these mistakes, Amy, okay, they're wonderful, they're wonderful, okay, they're, they're my dearest, okay, I, can, I can take the mic out of them, all right, okay, so, so because he's going to get grief when he goes home, okay, and because you are a dangerous woman, Amy, listen, 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 listen. I'll show you, I'll show you this, you're a dangerous woman, because you know you're a creator, right, you know you're a daughter of God, you know that your words are powerful, Amen. you create your own wealth, yeah, and because of that, I need to save this man <laughs> from sickness, from disease, from a future and a hope. Yeah. So I'm going to count down as Shane. And because everything you say is right. That's the interesting thing. That's the beauty of it. Everything she says is so right. He is everything she's saying he is. <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. The problem is that. Your wife knows you better than anyone else, my friend. Yeah. Wife's the same thing. Your husband knows you. Yeah? But if you judge yourself and say, you know, Shane says to Amy, today's communion Sunday. I waited for one month for this. <laughs> I've collected this month of all these judgments. No accusation. Amy is a good girl. She won't accuse. There's a difference. But because of that, I have looked, Amy, and I've seen exactly what you are saying. But can we today ask the Lord that he would get poor instead of me? That he would get sick instead of me? Can we ask the Lord today to be that propitiation? Can we ask him to take everything that you're saying, which is absolutely right. It's absolutely right. Thank you for showing those to me. But honestly, can we go today to the table and say, oh God, take my place. Come on. Come on, yes. Take my place. Because I'm identifying with your suffering. And oh Lord, now die for me. Get sick for me. Get poor for me. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Come on, he's, he's Lord. That's why he's Lord. That's why I call him Lord. That's why he's Lord. Because he, who will do it for you? Who will do it for you? I won't. I'm a good shepherd. I'll take a bullet for most of you. No, that's the truth. That's the truth. 
I lay my life down for most of you. That's why when we, we started doing this, we're not scared of man. We're serious about our business. We'll throw our money away just to serve you. But I can't save you from the accusations that are about you. My death, even if they shoot me when I leave this, I know who I am, man. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I don't move from that position. I'm saved by grace. I believe it. I'm a son. i sure. But a man of iniquity. A frail man. None like Jesus. His purity as a human being. As a human being. He was not just a God. He came as a man. But the way he lived in life as a man gave me the power to be able to live my life at least a little bit close to him. If you tell the king that Jesus had power, he had supernatural power, and therefore he didn't have to commit adultery? You think? Because he had supernatural power? You think Jesus had supernatural power, so therefore, because of that, he didn't have to give him to wealth? No. Then he's cheated, because you don't have that supernatural power. He came as a weak man, just like you. It was the foolishness of God. It says in 1 Corinthians, it is the foolishness of God. Foolishness of God. It's the weakness of God. It says that God became weak. It, it said that God became foolish when he became Jesus Christ. Please hear me out. Just imagine you're going to write that. Paul writes, the foolishness of God is across. The weakness of God. Do you understand? God became foolish in Jesus because he became a man. What a risk. Because he could be tempted. And he could fall. And he could make mistakes. He's the one who saved me. A man. A man saved me. That is why, my friend, when I tell you this, that you can live a holy life. I'm not joking. I'm not thinking. When I'm telling you, you can live a holy life. You can live a life that is faithful. You can live a life that is righteous. I'm telling you because I know a man... I know a man 2,000 years ago. And I know that that man has imparted that to me. Amen. That my word is good. Yeah. To the people I love. Come on. <laughs> you can't compare. But you can strive and love to be like. Yes. This amazing Jesus Christ. So, you judge yourself. And then you will not be judged. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay. Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Now listen carefully again. I've said this. I've looked at it from every single side. I've got Matthew 9. I'll teach a bit on that. I'm finishing James, okay? I land at James, okay? Yeah. All right, okay. So hold on tight. Now Matthew 9 is an interesting story. Again, you need to see it. Matthew 9. So why do we ordain people and make them priests? Why do we say we want ordained pastors to be here at the end to pray over you? Because those are the elders in the church. Can anyone do it? Yes. But, but many are called. But few choose to do that job. Few choose to do that job. Many are called. Few choose. Now, Matthew 9. Matthew 9 is an interesting, interesting chapter. A paralytic is laid before Jesus. And Jesus, you must understand the... The area, the context, is that Jesus is just a man. That's the context. Jesus is just a man. He's not even coming from the tribe of the priests. Do you understand the context? If you don't get this, then you don't get it. Jesus did not come through the Levite tribe. He came from just a man. He came just like you. Do you understand that? So he did not come from the Levite tribe. That means he doesn't have a right to be a priest. So only the priest have the right to forgive sins. Did you just get that? Okay. That is why the problem here is because they come and leave a paralytic. And he's the one who brought this concept. Jesus, being the son of God, brought the concept into the world. They leave a paralytic before him. And Jesus, now he's not a priest. So in those days, you can't do this. Because there is a temple set up. And there are sacrifices that you take to the temple. And you give those sacrifices to the temple. And those sacrifices then will save you from your sins. Yeah. Fruits and flowers. Get it? Sacrifices of bulls and goats. Yeah. You understand that? Those things that I explained before. They are given. And those sacrifices are accept, 
are accepted by the priest to try and to mitigate for your sins. But even they knew at that time that fruits and flowers and bulls and goats can't mitigate or mediate for the sins committed intentionally. That means adultery, if you talk of murder, if you talk of stealing, anything intentional could not be forgiven. They knew this. Come on, man, this is important. They knew that those cannot be forgiven by fruits and flowers or by lambs and goats. And that is why you find the woman who has committed adultery, remember that woman? She has committed adultery. What did they want to do? They didn't offer fruits and flowers or bulls and goats for her sin. What was offered for her sin was who? Was her. She, even then they knew that it was, if man commits intentional sin, that means he sears his conscience and he does it intentionally, what is going to be offered is man. <laughs> do you just see the foreshadowing of it? Yeah. Why Jesus didn't need to come? Because that's, if you do intentional sin, then it's a life for a life. Wow, do you just get that? Okay, so once you understood that, then you realize that they leave this paralytic before Jesus and Jesus looks at him and says this to him in verse 3. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, he says, son be of good cheer. Is it there? Son be of good cheer. Okay, that means, guys, when you come to the table, okay, do you go up to Solomon like, oh, oh my God, I'm a sinner? No. Be of good cheer. Come on, celebrate the table. You're coming. Yes, it's coming on Sunday. We are going to be saved. Be of good cheer. When you come into the table, it doesn't come like solemnly. Okay? You come like, be of good cheer. Why? When you eat of this table, your sins are forgiven you. Did you just get that? This is important. Why is it important? Because he's not saying you're healed. Many are sick, many are asleep. He says, your sins are forgiven you. So this man, this paralyzed man is now wondering, just imagine someone coming for prayer. The person is sick. I just want you to see this thing and this is what pastors don't do because of the previous doctrine where God has not forgiven your sin. Now you're done that, you're done that, God has forgiven your sin, right? You're, you're, you believe that, right? This is about life church. Okay. So if Shanta comes to me, now <laughs> we, got here, we got here now. <laughs> if Shanta comes to me and he's sniffling or he's not well, okay, or he's sick. And he says, Shanta, come on, I want to forgive your sins. Okay? Just imagine, he, wouldn't he turn around and say, come on, you know, Jesus came 2,000 years ago and my sins are forgiven. I'd say, yes, but you know that. I know that. But then, Kirby, what are you talking about? And this is a very, very interesting area. Because he says, whatever is against you now needs forgiven. Whatever is against you now, whatever you, you feel that is your iniquity that you are being judged on, I want to forgive you. Maybe Liz is having a hard time doing it. Okay, <laughs> she's laughing. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay, maybe Liz is having a hard time doing it. And I'm telling you, I'm bringing husbands and wives because it's important. Forgiveness is so important in a marriage. Yeah. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Parents, children, forgive your children. They're always complaining about your children. Oh, my son is on drugs. My daughter is on drugs. They don't come home. They are. Lives are ruined. Their marriages are ruined. Parents are saying constantly, yeah, have you forgiven them? Accusing, 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 accusing. Complaining. Complaining and accusing. Have you forgiven? Have you forgiven? Because the more you forgive, the more their lives get better. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a meditation. It's a meditation. It's a meditation. It's a meditation. I can tell you, recently with, the, my, with, with this other issue, that I had, I was praying two years. I was asking, Lord, I need a solution. Uh, one of our prayer, one of our members of prayer, that's uh, Grace, and, uh, Grace and Andrew Melrose, she, they're the head of the thrones and they pray constantly for us. They had a dream and in that dream, it's very strange and this is, God, God can do miracles in strange ways, right? In, in, the, in the dream, she's getting the medicine and the name for the medicine that she's giving me the bottle of medicine and I get healed. Just, just check this out, right? Lilani goes to Dubai because she saw Kelsey Bestovich, okay, in trouble at this church. She goes to Dubai and this was just last month. And while she's at Dubai, Kelsey gets sick and is rushed to the, the, the medical emergency. Just think about it. I remember a time when Fiona's mom 
needed, had an aneurysm in her head, and a doctor was treating her for a year uh, imbalance. And she had called from Abu Dhabi and said, the Lord spoke to me clearly and said, this is an aneurysm. And he said, no way. It's an imbalance of the year, an aneurysm. And then Trevor and, and Naomi, who were firm with the doctor, said, you need to get it checked. She's a prophetess, and she knows what she's talking about. And this doctor is like a doctor, right? And so he said, OK, and what do you say? Six millimeter aneurysm in the head about to explode. Come on. Why couldn't the doc, why couldn't, my question to you is why couldn't the God heal the aneurysm? Why couldn't God heal me? Why did he have to give me the medicine? You'll understand then. God comes as a man. He can heal me. You get 30, 60, 100. People don't understand healing. 30, 60, 100. Fold of the word bearing fruit. Maybe you come to church, you can get healed. Have I got healed at church? Yes. Have I got direction after I came to church on the exact doctor? Believe me, I'll tell you. I was waiting for an appointment to show my condition just recently. And I was like, I need to show my condition and I need to find a doctor. But none of the Sri Lankan doctors understood. I went. So... I found a functional medicine doctor. We paid like 300,000 bucks. You understand? This is the appointment. 300,000 rupees. Okay? To get the consultation. And I had to wait one month for the consultation. But then I remember, hey, you know what? I'm waiting for this consultation. I'd rather take what Grace and Andrew sent me. She had a dream. Okay? Let me just start taking this. I mean, honestly, just, like, don't do this if just anyone has a dream. Okay? It has to be someone at church. Please ask us. Don't take medication just because they give, they're not doctors, okay? So I kept it, you won't believe, for six months before I took it. She gave it, I kept it for two, six months. And I said, okay, I'm getting my uh, consultant. Maybe I started taking it, I did a bit of research on it, and then I started taking this medication, trust me. When I got into the functional medicine doctor, I'm paying 300,000 rupees for the consultation, just check this out. And I tell him the condition, I said, but doctor, the only problem is two weeks ago I started this medication, and I can't even show you the symptoms anymore because it's nearly done. And I said, then he went, are you serious? I told him, this is the medicine I took. He said, Kirby, I would have never even thought to give that to you. Wow. That's, really That's the truth. He said, I would have never even thought to give it to you. He said, but it's so interesting. And then he went and he researched and he said, there is research and there is science on this. This is real. Can you believe it? Yes. Just understanding how much God loves us. You know, just that thing, I just, just thinking about that, I thought, my God, God loves us so much that he will actually speak to my prayer warrior and he will reveal the right medicine I needed to take. And he gave yeah. you a functional doctor through Pete Mueller. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and he gave me a functional doctor through Pete Mueller, which is awesome. Okay, now, let's look at this, okay? So the man is laid before, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you, and the man is asking the question, like Shanta was asking the question, or like, where Shane had disappeared, is right? <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? Go on. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, I won't use you again. You can come and sit here. <laughs> yeah. okay. Oh my God. I, don't, I was like, oh boy, that was quick. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so, guys, this is serious stuff. Hmm? Many are sick, many are ill. So then the question that, that the man, could have asked is like, what have I done wrong to be paralyzed? Like Shanti could have asked, or Shane could have asked, or whatever it is, or I could have asked. Like, Lord, what have I done wrong? It's not like I have, it's not like I'm doing any grievous sin. You understand that? I live a holy life unto God. What am I, what have I done wrong? To whom much is given, much is required. Please understand. The more you climb this ladder, the more you stand here to pray, dude, much is required. Much is required. You say you're a man of God, much is required of you. There are times that I've got been so frustrated standing out, parked outside my garden and God, the Lord is saying, this I need you to look at. And honestly, it's so subtle and so small. So small. We have no grievous sins, ladies and gentlemen. But it is, sin is not like what you think. It, it's hamathaya. It means missing the mark. It's just an iniquity, a thought process. A, a, thought, a, a, a thought process that is worldly. As you grow in God, you can't have those things. And so therefore, you have to check your heart. And so... When those are there, then someone can judge you. And if they accuse you on it, you're in big trouble. 
Do you understand that? You're in big trouble. You see? And therefore, now the table is open and he says, your sin is forgiven. And the paralytic is like, what sin? The people around says, what sin? There's a temple. You're not a priest. You're just a man. You're a normal man born from a carpenter's family. How can you forgive sin? Is the question. And he says, this man talks blasphemy. And then he says, why do you think evil in your hearts? Four, verse five. Which is easier to say, arise and walk, or that man has the power. Say, man has the power. Man has the power. Say, man has the power. Man has the power. Say, man has the power. Man has the power to forgive sin. Okay? Why? Because man had the power to accuse you of your sin. Okay, we'll say it again. You're in this problem because man has the power to keep you in his bed. Man has the power to keep you in this bed, my friend. That is why. Do you understand that? So therefore, man has the power to forgive sin. We won't go to James. I'd rather go to Mark 8. Turn to Mark 8. And this is a small diversion. No, no need James. Mark 8. I'm going to show you this. Jesus has now healed a blind man. And while he's healed a blind man, he does something beautiful. I want you to see what he does. Okay? And you'll see, if you want to be healed, listen carefully to this story. In verse, chapter 8, verse 22. Then he came to Bethesda, and he brought a blind man to him. And they begged him to touch him. So there are people bringing the blind man. Now watch this. It's so strange. People bring you to church. The very person who brings you to church. And says, Kirby, I want you to pray for someone. And I'm leaving someone and say, I brought my uncle, I brought my aunt. Can you just pray? Can you pray? Okay, I'm not, I'm not faulting you. Okay, but I want you to see what is happening here. There's a situation. A mother brings his son. This happens all the time. The son is completely addicted. The son is in trouble. A, a father brings the children because the children are quarreling at home. I want you to see this. Okay, they, and he's begging Jesus to, forg to heal. Well, listen carefully. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Did you just get it? Yeah? He leads him out of the ones who brought. This is so cool. But at one point, he goes to a funeral. They're all crying in the funeral. He goes and he sees all the people weeping. The ones who loved this person, is, are they weeping? He says, he goes in and says, take them all out. Send all the mourners out. Because healing... And life is a perspective. It's a perspective. It's how you see it. You see, when you take a new perspective, if someone is saying, Kirby, you're like this. Kirby, and the public says, Kirby is like this, Kirby is like that, Kirby is like this. Have you seen Kirby General defend it? Have you seen Kirby and General defend it? Kirby General will not defend it. Because if they say something, they might be seeing something. Okay? And honestly, I will check my heart. I will check my heart. I'll go before my God. And I say, God, I turn this way. Oh, God, these are what people are saying. There are accusations against me. Oh, God, I want to judge myself today. If there is any smoke where this fire is coming from, I want to see it, oh, God. I want to see it, oh, God. I want to live in truth, my God. If they say Kirby is arrogant, that is true. If they say Kirby is proud, that is true. If they say Kirby, I want to defend that I'm humble. I'm a proud, arrogant, sinful, broken man that is trying to do Jesus well. That is trying his best to do Jesus well. Trying his best to do Jesus well. We're not going to defend it. We'll go to the table. We'll turn around and we'll judge ourselves so that they, your accusation and your judgment will not come upon me, my friend. Your accusation and judgment will not come upon me. When Fiona tells me something, I listen. Your wife tells you something, listen, man. Listen, she sees you more than anything. Listen, man. Turn around, turn around. Yeah. And I tell Fiona, thank you for telling me. I want you to tell me when I improve my ways. And I hear the same, because we're doing well in this area. Husbands, wives, the best person is next to you to tell you who you are. Don't defend yourself. Don't defend yourself. Because if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. Did you just get that? Now watch this. He took him outside. Very cool. He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, when I read this, I thought maybe he took him out because he needed to spit on his eyes. <laughs> maybe like if I needed to heal Jackie of her blindness, 
if I do it in front of you, it'll be so insulting for her because, you know, that's a, I mean, that's a crazy way of healing, right? I mean, just imagine the prophets start doing this kind of thing, you know, like spitting. So at least that shows a bit of courtesy. If you're going to do something stupid like that, take them outside where no one else can see you. You do all these things in front of the whole public. They are shamed and you are shamed. If you're going to push someone and they're going to fall or kick someone, they're going to fall. Do it where no one else can see. Because this at least shows a bit of church courtesy. <laughs> but honestly, it's not because of that. Okay? It's good to do things in private. If someone's falling and rolling, cover them. Don't show them on the camera. Fine, rolling. I like rolling, falling, shaking. We are charismatic service. Cover them. Don't show them on the camera. Cover them. Camera turn away from that. You got it? It's very important. So you keep someone's dignity. But it's because Jesus is taking a person, a blind man. Do you think the blind man even knows that he's going to spit? Do you think Jesus is telling him, no, I'm going to spit on you? <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought about this a long time because I, I really, when, when I go into, I go into stories, I see Jesus taking the man out of town. That this is a long walk. This is a long walk. That means he had to take this blind man, you know, blind, the guy is blind, so he has to lead him. By the hand, he's gone a long way from the people, long way from the people who brought him, from all the sorrow and the pain that they're seeing. Oh my God, my son is blind. And do you know that when people get sick, people immediately, I can tell the spirit of accusation, I'll tell you how it works. And you have to watch for it, Christians, because that's the devil himself. When someone gets sick or someone dies, the first thing that someone does is accuse. Yes. The first thing that someone does will accuse him immediately. Yeah, but so and so was this. That's the devil. That's what he's taking them, taking him away from. Because that could have been a mother, a father, a brother, and sister. Someone loses a job. The first thing that comes is not judgment. Judgment is fine. It's a thought. It's a very fast, quick. Yeah, but you know, it's justifying why they're sick. Come on, come on. Don't you? Know? He's justifying why they're sick. I used to when I because I know so much about food and all this stuff. I used to those days. Not anymore, but those days, I would justify very fast, this is why I probably are sick. And guess what? Guess what? It is why they're sick. It is why they're sick. It's the very reason that they're sick. You understand that? And it immediately an accusation can rise. Judgment is different. Judgment is not accusation. Judgment is a judgment where you can come and see the person, I think you're doing this and it's wrong. You should look at it. That's a different story. But I don't accuse you. I'm praying for you. Yeah. It's not a justification why you should remain there. But what happens as the judgment comes, if the person then says, no, that's not true. That means you are refuting the judgment. Do you understand that? Yeah. But if you judge yourself and say, yeah, that might be true. When someone tells me, why maybe you're sick? I don't say, no, that can't be true. I say, you know what, I'll pray about it. That might be true. <laughs> Self-reflect. I come to the table and I say, Lord, because these things are true, because there can be these things, because I'm only a man, because I'm weak, I need to self-reflect and see my weakness and eat off this table. And then he says, he spits on him and asks him, he, he asks him, did you see anything? I want you to stand up for this. Get ready. Because the benediction will play. And when they sing the benediction to you and bless you with the benediction, I want you to come to the table, I want you to eat, and I want you to check this, because this is the key about healing. If you want to get healed, if you want to get rich, if you want anything good to happen to you in life, you've got to follow this model, okay? This is the model. First, move away from those who don't believe in you. Do you understand that? You have to move away for that. You have to come out of that place. And then, once you're there, it's so important, so important that we friends who don't believe. For that moment, when you're coming to this table, say, you know what? I'm coming, I'm self-reflecting. I'm changing, I'm looking at my heart now. Yes, I see it. And that is why we always say that accusation must be taken off. If you're a believer, you can't accuse. You can judge. Please understand, Fiona judges me on a daily basis. I judge her on a daily basis. And we are so open to our judgment because we know that it's coming without accusation. We know it's coming in love so that we can grow. Don't confuse judgment and accusation. They're two completely different things. Jesus takes the man out of the very people who brought him. Very, very interesting. Is it there? 
he spits in his eyes. He says, look up. And a man has a partial he healing. Do you just see it there? Is it a full healing? No, he says something very prophetic. He says, I think I see a little. I see men like trees. He says, I'm seeing slightly. And this is the key about healing, guys. It's the key about your wealth and your riches. You first need to see the good. He's changing your perspective. He's changing what you feel. And he says, you know, I think I'm a bit stronger. I think I can make it. I think I can resist now. I think I have the power not to do that again. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling slightly better. I feel happier now. And he's identifying with what God is doing. Do you just see there? Yeah. But this guy was still blind. But when you have no faith, you will not say, I see men like trees. He'll say this and I say, sometimes pray for people. And they say, I can't see anything still. You can still see the darkness. They say, no, it's still black. No, no, I see something, but it's not full. Do you understand that? Acknowledging that is power. Then he's put his hands on his eyes again. I like this one, and he made him look up. It's all models and mechanics, right? Look up to God. And then he restored, his eyes were restored, and he saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house. Do you see that there? To the house or where he's supposed to belong to the people who love him. He goes back home, but he says, do not go back to the town that I took you out of. Do you see there? Okay. Do not, you can go back home to the people who love you, but do not go back to the town. The reason is the town you are in can be the town of unbelief. The town you're in can be those people who always talk badly about your faith who always talk badly about your church, who always say, oh, this church can do nothing good for you. That's the town. Go back to the ones who love you because now you can see well and tell them, Jesus, heal me. I'm seeing you new again. I'm seeing your beauty again. Wife, I see you in the fullness again. When the benediction is done, I want you to experience two things. You take the communion. You examine yourself. Then you be of good cheer. Don't go there and examine yourself. Examine yourself now. I think most of you all have. Then come here in good cheer. Give someone a hug. And then I want you to check for a problem with your body. If you were sick in some place, and what's going to happen first is you're going to have a partial healing. Is that okay? I want to train you in this. You'll have a partial healing. In fact, many of your eyes, many people today who are wearing specs and glasses, many people will have a partial healing. And then again, I want you to check again a second time. And this time, I want you to turn to someone next to you, a man, and say, will you lay hands on me? Or a woman, a man or woman, yes, please. A man, a man, yeah, capital. But a man or woman next to you and say, can you lay your hands on me and release forgiveness over my life? I need forgiveness. I've self-reflected. I've seen me for myself. And then I want you to check again, especially your eyes. We're going to have testimonies. Your bodies. Your, your, the, the, your, your habits will be broken. Your anger, your bitterness, your depression will break today. And then I want you to grab the mic because the testimony is so important. And if you've got healed, come up to me. Ask the mic while the choir is singing. And please declare and testify your healing. Come on, church. The table is open. Father, in Jesus' name, let me pray. Father, we praise you. We honor you. We thank you for the broken body of Christ that he lays before me. On the night that you were betrayed, you took this bread, you broke it, and you said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You took the cup of the new covenant of your blood, and you said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood poured out for the remissions of your sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. When you come to the table, he says, you've got to discern the body of Christ. And if you judge yourself, you yourself will not be judged. Do you understand that? And you will not be condemned with the world. So I want you to come now discerning the body. 
discerning your covering, discerning who you are as a person, as a human being, discerning your mistakes, not being condemned, not feeling accused because Jesus has completely forgiven you your sins 2,000 years ago. But you're looking at men and saying, you know what? I won't be judged by you. You will not tell me anything that I didn't know about myself. I know me. Do you get that? I know me. And I want you to now come to the table and receive your healing. The table is open. All yours. Now I want you, if you're sick in the house, I want you to check your body. Check your body. And say, Lord, thank you for your healing. And you'll see that you'll have partial healing in areas. There'll be partial healing. The pain would have gone slightly or half or 70%. And if that's you, that you received like the man who saw partially, take your specs out. Check your specs as well. Check your, check your, in your eyes. These words are powerful. And if it's you, and you can see maybe slightly better, then I want you to wave at me. Check yourself. Just wave wherever you are and let me know what has happened. Just raise your hand. Who is that there? Yeah. yeah. My feet paining and it was uh, in quite a painful, I have been having for some time. Now the pain has gone. So you had pain, how long? How long was that? How long? I have been having from March onwards. From March onwards. Come on guys. Isn't this awesome? From March onwards. You must understand this bread that this bread that you are eating has been prayed over by us. We make it at home specifically for your healing. Who else? Who else feels better? I was yeah. sick last night. Yeah. I don't feel any sickness now. Any sickness. And what was it? It was like a flu or uh, yeah, throat? A yeah. Cough. Cough. Yeah. Come on. Fever. Come on. Fevers are getting healed. Come on. Come on. Right there. Behind there. Right here. Uh, sick. I think since yesterday and yeah. uh, I couldn't even stay up during church. I was trying to stay up. I was just sneezing throughout. And I feel so much better right now. I so feel we, like it's so lifted awesome. off and a headache has lifted off. Wow. It's yeah. the same thing. Just yeah. like Kitty, right? You're talking about flus and viruses being dispelled. Yeah. Now you know that that takes a long time to go, right? That thing takes a long time to go, but we're dispelling it. You're feeling better? Yeah. Come on. Yes. Come on. Let's have it there. Mother has been complaining like over a year now about an uh, eye issue. Yeah. So uh, there's something called the macula hole, like yes. you know, on a left eye. There's something called the macula, and there's a hole. And yes. then we tried like so many places, like you know, get it operated, but everyone was advising it can't be done because there's no possibility of like you know getting the vision back. Wow, look at it. How long has that been there for? About one and a half years. One and a half, one and half years. years yeah. <laughs> wow, this is amazing. Yeah. And and, and uh, when you were like specifically saying about eyesight, I yeah. tapped and said, "This is for you today." Yeah. <laughs> And then she was like, it's visible. Yeah. But I said partial healing. Yes, no? Not yes. Full absolutely, healing. Partial absolutely, healing. Yeah, healing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was just trying to type and show this later to her. Yes. First I typed J. Yeah. She was able to identify it's J. Wow. And now it's E. Again, <laughs> she was able to identify it's That e. is amazing. Because so, sometimes when I when we show the whole finger like yeah. this. She only sees, okay, there is something like this, you know, like, right, there's right. like, you know, something you wow. see like a shadow, wow. but not specific. That is writing that small letter, seeing that small letter is a miracle. Wow, yeah. auntie. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Auntie, may you have complete and perfect healing. I just want you to look up. Just like Jesus asked, you want to look up, I want you to look up. Look up. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, I declare, if anyone has eyesight that needs to be healed, your body needs to be healed now fully, completely. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, just look up. Father, right now, we declare full and perfect healing in Jesus' name. Right now, right now, right now. Church, over your life, perfect and full healing. Perfect and full healing. Perfect and full healing. The choir, the choir had something. What happened in the choir? The little ones are getting healed. Isn't it cool when you have like little kids doing this? Isn't it awesome? So cool. Let me have. Yeah. When you said, uh, like, for the eyesight, yeah. I removed my glasses and tried to read this, and I could read it. You could read without the glasses? Oh, but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want you to see this. Now, Ethan, right here, right here, it's the same family. 
It's the same family. That's his dad. Come on, isn't that awesome? That's his grandmother and dad. Can you believe? God is opening the eyes. Now what we must understand is this is not just a healing. It's a prophetic declaration to the church. Now if you see it like that, you have more. It's not just about healing. God is prophesying to the church that your eyes are opening. Even our young ones will start seeing better. Do you understand that? Is it Nicole? Now this is another young one. You have to say something? Last Tuesday, yes. I was wearing my glasses and usually I won't be able to see that one like at all. Yeah. And then uh, for, after we prayed over the eyes, yes. I was able to see that and I came and told Auntie Fiona. She wow. told me that if it gets any better to come and tell her yeah. on next Sunday. Yeah. And usually without my glasses, I won't be able to read this at all. Wow. Now I can read it. Come on! Wow. Guys, 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 wait, 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 hold on, hold on. This is so cool. Wow. It is so cool. You know why? Like, I hope you're trained well now, Wow. It's not about the healing. It's about the prophetic opening that is happening to the church. If you see that, it's partial to full. People are partially seeing the revelation. People are partially receiving certain things, but even the young ones are growing in the fullness of what God is doing. Come on, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Uh, come on, can we worship Him? Amen. Church. May you be blessed. May you go with His blessing, with His healing, with His restoration. May your eyes from partial be fully open. May you see His beauty constantly in the people around you. May you be reconciled and may you be able to bless those who are around you. Father, we thank you that judgment and accusation is done. We thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven. We are a blessed people. We are a restored people a rich people, a healed people because of your son. We thank you. We bless you, Lord. Church, be blessed. I'll see you on Tuesday.